Well, I'm going to start the discussion here. Rather than sort of opening it up to your general thoughts, I, I want to introduce, uh, introduce what he's talking about here, uh, really both aspects of what he's talking about here, um, this, uh, the fact-value dichotomy as well as the, um, the question of relativism. Um, I want to introduce these topics uh, by telling a brief, seemingly unrelated anecdote. Um, so St. Augustine of Hippo was a bishop in the uh, 5th to 6th centuries. And he, uh, he's, I've mentioned before, incredibly prolific, wrote about just about everything there is to write about. And so everyone who writes about um, all manner of topics surrounding the uh, sort of late antiquity through the Middle Ages, everyone will refer to Augustine or say that you know, Augustine said such and such. And so there are a few uh, quotes floating around that he may or may not have said, but everyone sort of says that he said. Um, this is one of them. So somebody is uh, said to have asked uh, St. Augustine, um, what was God doing before he created the world? As a sort of gotcha question. Right? And so Augustine is said to have responded, he was creating the fires of hell for people who ask stupid questions like that. Now, again, I don't actually think that he said this. I can't find a real citation for him saying it. And most of the people who do quote him saying it don't have citations. They just say, well, Augustine said, and then they tell the funny bit. Now, why I bring this up is so we can kind of examine what he means by this being a stupid question and then maybe apply some of that same reasoning to McInerney's defense of the position we've been building against these, uh, these possible alternatives or these possible criticisms. So what does he mean? Why is what was God doing before he created the world a stupid question? In other words, why does the question not make sense? Right, and I mean, well, God did. Why I say did with a question mark is because, well, it, it's to point out part of the problem, so take that as a hint. You're on the right track, right? Nothing existed before the world was made. So why not, why does this, this why does the question, what was God doing before he created the world? Why doesn't that make sense as a question? Before that. We don't know. <laughs> well, why not? Why don't we know? To give, a slight, to give a slight reiteration, the story I told just before we came here was somebody asked Augustine, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, that question, 5th, 6th century AD. Um, somebody asked him that question. He's alleged to have said, we can't confirm this, but he's alleged to have said he was preparing the fires of hell for people who ask stupid questions like that. So, and now again, I don't know if he actually said this. He was a cantankerous old man later in his career, but, so maybe. Um, to the point where, uh, where several commentators on, uh, on Augustine later on uh, said things like, well, late in his life, um, he, may have, uh, he may have developed some, uh, some a nicer way of saying senility um, in, his, uh, in his anger at, uh, at people who said wrong things, basically. Yeah. So it's possible that he said this. We don't have any official record of him having said it. But it makes a point, which is that this question fundamentally doesn't make sense to someone in some way. Right? It's not just that we don't know, it's that there can't be an answer to the question. Why not? It's not just that. It goes way beyond that. Anybody? Way back. Why doesn't it make sense to ask, in general, what happened before the world began? It's a hypothetical. What do you mean? Well, what do you mean? And then we'll get to, get to your point. What do you mean, hypothetical? Everybody can have a different answer based on their beliefs and knowledge. Maybe, but I think that I think that the question is trying to ask what what really happened. And if something really 
were the case, then even if a bunch of people get it wrong, somebody could potentially get it right. Problem is that Augustine's implication here is that no one can get the question right. And that's kind of the point of the question. It's a gotcha question. Right? It's intended as a kind of, um, a kind of um, trying to get you to answer an unanswerable question to trip you up, that kind of thing. So what's tricky about it? Did you want to give it a shot? It's not even that. It's not even that. Like, there are things that there's no way to know. Right? There, there are questions that you can't answer just due to a limit of our knowledge. Things like, I don't know, um, how many rocks are on the moon? <laughs> Can you, though? I mean... Isn't the moon a rock? That counts as one, but then there's also a bunch more on top of it, right? So this is a question with an answer, but it's not one that anyone could realistically answer, right? And it's it, the reason that no one could realistically answer it is not because there's no answer to the question. It's because of the impracticality or maybe even impossibility of coming up with an answer in a finite human amount of time. Right? Counting the rocks on the moon would take very long. Now, even if we were able to solve problems like how big or how small does it have to be to count as a rock rather than a boulder or a you know, a moon or dust, right? If we say that a rock is anything between that big and that big made of silicate matter, primarily, great, we now have a perfect category. Arbitrary, but fine. And there is a particular finite number of rocks between this big and this big on the moon. No one knows what that answer is. God might, probably does. I think probably might be blasphemy, but let's just say does, okay. But the point being is there is an answer to the question, but even if no one can realistically figure it out. The question, what was God doing before he created the world, is worse than that. Because there isn't an answer to the question, because there can't be an answer to the question, why not? Why can't there be an answer? Is it an oxymoron? Kind of. Does it make sense? Yeah. Why? What's nonsensical about it? One way of referring to the, uh, the creation of the world is uh, the beginning of time, right? So if we ask what happened before time, before time, what does that mean? Before time. Correct, it means nothing. Before time is an oxymoron, it's nonsensical, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't refer to anything because it can't. The idea that Augustine was trying to get across is that when God created the world, that was when reality began. It's not like God was sitting around for some duration of hours thinking about creating the world and then decided to at some point. No, time, duration, sequences of events began at some point, before which there were no sequences of events or duration or things like that to talk about in these ways. So there is no before. So the question doesn't make sense. So it's not just a stupid question in the sense that, well, you're asking questions that are hard to answer. You're asking questions that are ultimately nonsensical. And also not nonsensical. They don't make sense. Right? Again, it's because it, it's like, uh, why am I talking about this? I'm gonna have to though. So as I've mentioned before, um, I. I have uh, I've talked extensively in a, in a video that's I think in the supplemental material. If it's not, I guess I'll put it in there about uh, about the Marvel series Loki. I've talked about this a little bit. Okay. So has anyone seen it? Anyone seen Loki the series? No. Okay, you have. Uh, if you haven't, there is uh, the 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 time variance authority, basically the time cops, come and show up and and rip Loki out of the timeline after he screwed things up in Avengers Endgame, right? So 
They take him out of the timeline to this weird bureaucratic office that they have, which is supposed to be outside of time and space, presumably, but outside of time is the most relevant part. And yet, things happen one after the other in a sequence of events that one might even be tempted to call time. It doesn't make sense, again, because you can't have time outside of, or in Augustine's case, before time. Time simply is a description of the, of the duration and process of things happening and changing. If you say that something is before time or outside of time, that just means that there is no sequence of events. There is no sequential change. And so to ask what was happening before time is not to ask anything. It's just to make a bunch of noises with a question mark at the end. OK. Makes sense, kind of. OK, if it doesn't make sense, that's also fine, because philosophy of time is wildly complicated, and I should never talk about this, and yet I somehow do a lot. In fact, the philosophy of time gives me terrible headaches. In fact, I can feel one coming on right now. Um, and yet, I wind up talking about it a lot because I have, uh, tragically, developed something of reputation among you know, philosophers that I talk to and friends and colleagues of being you know, that guy who knows something about the philosophy of time which is mostly because people ask me about it because I've developed a reputation for knowing something about it. It's really tragic. It's one of those professional ironies. Yes? About Dykes and Nietzsche. Better? In concepts of the time. Probably. Honestly, I, in that video, I, I, I will point to what I think is the best, the best instance of at least popular fiction. There are some like really esoteric sci-fi stories that do a good job with time travel. Um, but one of the most like popular level uh, like TV and movies kind of display of time travel is probably Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which it doesn't take itself even the least bit seriously. And I think that's where they get it right. Um, because, because by moving backwards and forwards through time, you start messing around with causal sequences. And you have to acknowledge that that means that causal sequences start looping back in on each other in very strange and odd ways that most time travel stories just say, oh, I'm not going to deal with that. We're just going to go back in time and see what happens. Um, so I think that, that oddly, Bill and Ted actually handles it quite well. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it's, it's like a 1990 stoner flick starring Keanu Reeves before he was you know, current year Keanu Reeves. It was good. Anyway, Back to the Future is decent, though. It's a good movie, regardless of whether the time travel makes any sense or not. I think it makes a little sense. I haven't put enough thought into it to find all of the problems, I'm sure. Specifically, one of the most it's kind weird of weird cars to use. Like, the DeLorean? Yeah. DeLoreans can go 88 miles an hour. Yeah, they're they're decent. They're good cars. They're they were, a, I mean, kind of. Okay, well, okay. They have they have very odd design choices. Every time in the past has had a weird idea of what the future would look like, including us today. So, and and we've all been wrong so far, wildly. And so things that are supposed to look future futuristic very quickly look dated. That's how that works. And so the, the up-down doors on a DeLorean were meant to be like super futuristic. And then like five years later, it's like, what the hell were you thinking? We're not doing this. Anyway, th that goes for like everything. Remember the, um, remember the Honda Cube? They still make them. They're sort of bulbous, but also very square. I need to, I need to show you now. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I have to. Uh, Oh, that's a modern looking one. I meant this. This is the first one that came out. That, that, that thing. That shape. That, that's the, con that's the original like, concept art of the thing. Um, that was supposed to be like a very futuristic looking vehicle in like 2006. Futuristic? Yeah, that's what they thought we would be driving in current year, 10, 15 years ago. Oh, because the back doors open the other way. They open the, like refrigerator doors. It doesn't make sense, but this is what happens when we try and be futuristic. It does, doesn't it? 
I think that's why I thought refrigerator doors, because there are other doors that open like this. And I don't want, it does look like a refrigerator. Oh yeah, here, here, here's an actual one with the doors open. This is a more recent model when they toned down the futuristic look to make it actually look, look, look like what the future has turned out to look like, which is not the original concept design. Can you get me started on those fonts like Scion? I drove a smart car for like five years. I loved it. It could, it could turn in its own radius, which was like that. Wonderful. It's a wonderful little vehicle. Um, also got like 50 miles per gallon, and it was, it was not electric. It was full gas. Pretty great. Anyway, if you only need two seats, it's a good car. I can park it sideways in a standard parking spot. It's fun. All right, anyway. That actually is relevant somehow, somehow <laughs> to one of the examples that he uses about the Yugo. Did anyone catch that when he's talking about the Yugo, the car? Wait, was that in this? First of all, no, 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 that McInerney, uh, that, uh, McInerney is using. Now, I could be mixing up the additions because this is that, cha that, that chapter where he made extensive changes between this, the original edition, and the updated edition that was released 20 or so years later. Um, so he might not have actually used that example. I might be mixing something up. Um, in either case, the Yugo is a, uh, is a notoriously bad and, ac and not accident prone, um, breakdown prone uh, Soviet car. It's also very small, like comically small, like clown car small. What's that? Oh, the lot. Oh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, the Yugo is also. It wasn't. Wasn't Soviet, was it? Was it originally Soviet design? I'm trying to think if it was. Either way, bad car. Notorious in reputation. Yeah, the Lada is the other one I was thinking of that, that also basically falls apart on wheels often. Anyway, I digress. Why I was talking about all of this, and why I brought up the example of Augustine. Uh, is because when we look to questions about uh, the fact-value dichotomy, we wind up with uh, we wind up being able to criticize the criticism, or I guess respond to the criticism in a similar way by pointing out that the questions being asked are innately nonsensical, but just like are trying to figure out what was wrong with the question, what was God doing before he created the world, it was kind of hard for us to figure out exactly what was wrong with it, even though we all kind of recognized that it was kind of an odd, maybe a weird, maybe even a dumb question. We all sort of innately recognized it. It was a little bit hard to figure out exactly what was wrong with it. And just so for this one, this seems kind of intuitive, but we can work through it and figure out exactly what's wrong with this, uh, with this idea that he's presenting. Okay. So that's why I was introducing it that way. So what do we think of this section of the text? That is both the fact-value dichotomy and uh, the rest of this chapter, um, the, where he talks about the pre-moral character of principles. And uh, this kind of ties in with the previous section of the fact-value dichotomy. And then the basic value egalitarianism, basically that certain basic values all are equivalent to one another. Um, and there is no sort of list uh, sort of ordering of priority. That is sort of the transition into where he gets to the point on, uh, on relativism. All right, so what did we think of uh, any, any general thoughts here that we want to begin with? Any points that we want to uh, contest? Anything in here that we want to look at? Anything you weren't sure about, you want to ask about, you want me to try and clarify? What did you think? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So like I said, this is uh this is relating to relating to this uh this idea of the, the fact value dichotomy or the is ought distinction. When he says that the when not he, sorry, when when Grises and Finnis say that the natural law is pre-moral. What that means is that the precepts of the natural law, things like good is to be done and evil is to be avoided, things like that, 
um, are not strictly, um, they're not moral statements in the sense that they are not categories by which human actions are defined as, as right or wrong. They are, um, they're simply first principles of action. The kinds of things that we, uh, that we, I'm trying not to say ought to pursue because they try and avoid saying ought to pursue. Go ahead, yeah. Wouldn't it be that we as humans create morality first before uh, facilitating that drama? What do you mean? Oh, so this isn't really talking about um, sort of temporal sequence, like what happened first. This is more talking about um, logical sequence. Which is the more fundamental, uh, the more fundamental aspect of our thinking that we have to build upon to get to the other one? So the idea here is that these 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 first principles of of practical reason, uh, these, uh, these these basic fundamental principles of natural law, etc. What these are are uh, are something like the laws of logic, but applied to uh, how he puts it, how uh, this this different way of of intelligence um, applying to action rather than applying to uh, seeking truth. Right. Um, so, with this list of values, so life, knowledge, play, aesthetic experience, sociability, practical reasonableness, and religion that these things are things that we, uh, we can always pursue as ends in themselves. Remember, so remember this distinction between something that is for the sake of something else and something that's an end in itself that's worth, uh, worth pursuing on its own right. Bless you. So think back to, um, to when we were reading Plato. Right? And, uh, and we look at this distinction between, uh, between things like health, which are good for their consequences, but also good in themselves, but then things like harmless pleasures, which are only good for their own sake. They're not good for anything else that they get you. And then things that are pursued just as, as means rather than as ends, things like money, right? money or power, or things like that. This list here, all, uh, all seven of these according to Grisez, are, um, are intended to be things that are worth pursuing simply for their own sake. And so they are ends towards which we direct our action, and together they are constitutive of, uh, of the ultimate good, of the highest good. But that there's no particular order to them. And so order here means that it's not like you ought to pursue knowledge for the sake of life or life for the sake of knowledge. It's that you pursue life, both your own and that of other people around you, and you pursue knowledge. And you can do one more or the other less or, or vice versa. And as long as you are not working against any of the other ones in your pursuit of one of them, the particular order of priority doesn't matter. Now, they argue again that this is not yet ethical reasoning. This is not yet moral reasoning. The, real, the reason for that is that, that the fact that these things are themselves worth pursuing isn't meant to be a moral statement. This is supposed to be sort of the framework for what we mean by moral statements. This is, in other words, the transition from is to ought. But they are fundamentally uh, very basic ought statements. Right? I ought to pursue life or knowledge or play or all the, the whole list. These are things that we ought to pursue, and that there is no like rational basis for that, right? There's no, there's no. I should pursue this because it is constitutive of my overall flourishing, because I am a particular kind of thing, and simply the fact that I am a particular kind of thing means that I ought to pursue it. Or it's nothing like that. It's simply that we do in fact value these things because they are valuable, and therefore we value them, and therefore when we act, we're pursuing them. When we act to pursue them, we're doing good. And we act against them, we're doing bad. Does that help? 
Maybe? Okay. Where are we losing? Where are we losing the plot here? I will say, this bit here, the, the argument that he's referring to in, uh, by Grisez primarily, and also a little bit in Venice, is it's odd. It's definitely odd. He treats it as odd as well, and I tend to agree. I think that this is a strange way of conceiving of, of uh, fundamental value. So he says, the first underived self-evident principles, the precepts of natural law, are in his view pre-moral, not yet moral. What thus come down to is the claim that the ends of the inclinations mentioned in, uh, in the treatise on natural law what Grisez calls basic values are not moral values. By this, he does not seem to mean that the instinctive desire for sexual congress is when felt neither good nor bad from a moral point of view. So he doesn't mean that sort of our desires are morally neutral, even though they might be. He doesn't mean that it that our particular desires and inclinations are simply there. What he seems to mean is that the comprehensive good, continuing, which is to be pursued, i.e. the ultimate end, is not a moral value. It's just something that we, ought to that we ought to pursue. Now, if that sounds like a distinction without a difference, yeah, kind of. Maybe it is. Maybe he's trying to make a distinction here to avoid what he sees as the fallacy of trying to go from is to ought. Basically, basically, I think that what McInerney is getting at here is that, that Finnis and Crusades are trying to make a distinction where there isn't really one. So they're trying to say that all of these values, which we think of as moral values, are not technically moral values. They're just sort of the basic groundwork for moral values. But then when does it become a moral value is, is a weird open question that seems like it might not have a proper answer. So maybe you're being confused is kind of the right response here. I don't know. I, what do you think? Yes. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. OK. I think it might help, perhaps, if we start to first clarify what is meant here by the fact-value dichotomy, or what I've, in the syllabus at least, called the is-ought pseudo problem. Um, first, to clarify my terminology, a pseudo problem uh, is a term often used by professional philosophers and almost no one else that, uh, that attempts to describe something which seems to be a profound problem or a thing that is difficult to figure out, but actually is just a fundamental misunderstanding. And so the, um, I would, of course, describe the, the fact-value dichotomy, as stated here, to be a kind of pseudo-problem. Um, other such pseudo-problems, as understood by other disciplines, might be, um, as best I understand it, things like quantum indeterminacy. Right? So the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment where the cat that in the, in the box with the radioactive isotope is both alive and dead at the same time. This is generally, like most physicists who don't take the one particular very strange interpretation of this thought experiment, most physicists, physicists think that this is a pseudo problem. That it isn't actually the case that the cat is both alive and dead. It's just that the answer can't be determined until you observe it. The answer is fundamentally indeterminate from uh, from prior laws of physics. And so this idea that there seems to be a contradiction in the physical world is not a real problem. It just seems like a problem because we're misunderstanding something. Right? And so I, I, following McInerney here, would argue that the fact-value dichotomy is something of a pseudo-problem. Seems like a problem, but only if we're not careful with how we understand things. OK, so what is the fact-value dichotomy? What is the core point here that he's pointing to and trying to argue against. So he quotes Grisez right here at the beginning. If one supposes that principles of natural law are formed by examining kinds of action in comparison with human nature, 
and noting their agreement or disagreement. All right, pause there. Pause before we continue on with the sentence. That is, I think, a fairly adequate description of what we've been doing so far, right? We've been looking at certain kinds of action, looking at the way we do things, choices that we make, and comparing them to human nature. What does it mean to be a human being? What, excuse me, what are our characteristic ends? What are the things that we ought to pursue and that are, in fact, perfective of the nature that we have? That whole framework. Okay. Then, he says, if this is your framework, then one must respond to the objection that it is impossible to derive normative judgments from metaphysical speculations. So, quote, it is impossible to derive normative judgments from metaphysical specu speculations. What does that mean? Give it a try. So it's right here, this. It is impossible to derive normative judgments from metaphysical speculations. What, do, what does metaphysical mean? We talked about this a few times earlier on. I don't remember. So this is, metaphysics is one of the big branches of philosophy. There's three major branches of philosophy. There's epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, and how we know and what we know. There's ethics, which is what we're studying, what to do, what ought to be the case. And then there's metaphysics, which is the study of the nature of reality and what is, and how things fundamentally are. So metaphysical speculations here would be things like, um, speculations don't, don't take this in, in a sort of dismissive sense. Um, this just means um, understanding things like human nature, what it is to be a human being, what kinds of things are we, and what what is the fundamental nature of the actions, what ends are we in fact pursuing, as distinct from normative judgments, which are judgments about what ought to be the case or what ought to be done. So normative judgments can be anything from ethical precepts, like, like murder is wrong, to, uh, to simple like instruction manuals, like the packet that comes with your IKEA furniture. That's a normative statement that you should follow these instructions to put together your furniture. And again, that is, uh, that's still normative because it tells you what you ought to do. It's just under a very particular narrow context, whereas ethical judgments like murder is wrong are broadly applicable to all human beings in all circumstances. Another way of thinking about the distinction between little narrow normative judgments and broad ethical normative judgments is that normative judgments on the narrow scale are about doing a particular thing. Right? There's a right way and a wrong way to put together your furniture. Whereas big picture ethical uh, normative judgments or normative precepts are about whether there's a right way and a wrong way to be a human being, to act sort of in general. Now keep that, keep that, uh, that example in mind because I'm gonna probably come back to that I think that's a, a useful illustration of how we might get normative judgments out of metaphysical speculations. Uh, but keep that in mind. We are, I want to go through and sort of follow uh, McInerney's line of reasoning as well first. Okay, um, now this idea that normative claims cannot be derived from metaphysical claims uh, dates back to, uh, to a philosopher named David Hume um, who wrote in the 18th century, I think? Early 18th century, if I remember right. I have no idea. Remember the time period that I don't remember very well between 1277 and 1977. Um, but um, David Hume came up with this idea that ought statements, normative claims, claims about what ought to be the case or what ought to be done, have to have as their basis some other normative or ought type claim, a value claim, a value judgment and that it's not sufficient to base those judgments on matters of fact, things that are, um, uh, things that are metaphysical or non-normative. If we think back to C.S. Lewis, uh, I have a couple pages marked for this. So if we think back to C.S. Lewis when we read um, The Abolition of Man, right? this is when he's talking about, this is from the second chapter. When he's talking about the innovator, 
So when he's talking about the question of whether we should be selfish or selfless, <clears throat> and whether it's more rational to be selfish or more rational to be selfless, and he says the innovator has to say, well, kind of neither, he gives this as a reason. Neither choice is rational or irrational at all. From prescriptions about fact alone, no practical conclusion can ever be, dr ever be drawn. This will preserve society, cannot lead to do this, except by the mediation of society ought to be preserved. This will cost you your life, cannot lead directly to do not do this. It can only lead to it through a felt desire or an acknowledged duty of self-preservation. Okay. And then to summarize, he says, the innovator is trying to get a conclusion in the imperative mood. So in other words, value statements or ought statements or normative claims. Out of premises in the indicative mood. In other words, fact statements or metaphysical claims. And though he continues trying to all eternity, he cannot succeed, for the thing is impossible. Now, I mentioned at the time that this is one of the, this is one of the parts uh, of Lewis's writing that I think is significantly open to criticism. And this is also, at the, at the time, I mentioned that there is, uh, there's a couple of ways of taking this, uh, this kind of statement. You can either take this to mean that this is a problem for the innovator in particular, or you can take this to mean that this is simply how it works, this, that you can't derive uh, value statements from factual statements. And I said at the time, again, I believe, that I think that this is in fact uh, Lewis sort of buying into this fact-value dichotomy, perhaps a little too much. Now again, if we're being a little bit more charitable, we can say that, well, maybe he's just attributing this to the innovator, and maybe it's not so much a problem, but I digress, this is, um, this is regardless, an assumption that is actually quite common in ethical discourse, going back to David Hume. So to look at Lewis's example, or one of, one, or I guess he gives two examples, but. So he says, this will preserve society, cannot lead to do this, except by the mediation of society ought to be preserved. Okay, so this will preserve society is a factual statement. This is a statement about what will happen if you do this thing. If you say, um, he's talking particularly about uh, dying for one's country, so if you go and risk your life uh, in, uh, in just warfare, it will preserve society. Okay? That's a factual claim. That is, what, that is, well, if he's correct, if the claim is correct, that is, what will happen if you do this action? Okay? But he says this cannot lead to, therefore, do this. In other words, it ought to be done. You ought to do this in order to preserve society, unless you're already considering the premise, society ought to be preserved. Unless you already think that society should be preserved, which is itself a value statement. So unless you already have a value statement in your premises, you're not going to get a conclusion that gives you a what you ought to do. Okay. So this seem we're getting an idea of what he means by this fact value dichotomy. Questions about this? Pretty clear. Basically, that you can't derive a uh, conclusion in the imperative. In other words, you ought to do this merely from statements of fact. This is the case, or that is the case, or here's how this works, or you are this kind of a thing, or society works in this way, or anything like that. Uh, you can't derive a conclusion in the indicative from premises in the, how does he put it? Or sorry, nope, don't write that down. I get it backwards. Erase, erase. You can't derive a, a conclusion, you cannot derive a conclusion in the imperative from premises merely in the indicative. There we go. Indicative. In other words, you can't derive a value claim from a fact claim.
So here, McInerney describes it as the distinction between the normative and the factual, valuation and description, ought and is. He says, the passage just quoted, so all of this that we've been just talking about, suggests that there is something illicit in the passage from such sentences as, Wheaties are good for you, to you ought to eat Wheaties, being a particular kind of healthy but rather disgusting breakfast cereal. You know frosted mini wheats? Even those are kind of old fashioned these days. They're like these little like things of like wheat strands with frosting over the top. Okay, picture that without the frosting and about four times as big. Now you have Wheaties. The chunks of like grain that are like that. It's not, not a pleasant thing to eat in the morning, but apparently they're quite healthy. So sure, um, contains lots of dietary fiber and added protein, all kinds of wacky stuff that is quite good for you. Okay, therefore you should eat them. Well, we can see why you would derive that conclusion. Right? If something is healthy for you, therefore you should eat it. Right? We, we get this kind of intuitively. However, the person insisting on this distinction is going to point out that the only reason that that argument has any force, the only reason that you see that one follows from the other, is because you're already implicitly assuming that, uh, that there is another uh, value premise. There is an ought premise that you ought to do things which are healthy, or health is worth pursuing, or your own health is a value. Okay. Okay, so as an alternative to this, Finnis and Grisez, who are trying to defend the, the ideas broadly that we've been talking about, but trying to do so in a way that doesn't make this apparent jump from is to ought. They propose what we were talking about earlier as an alternative. This idea that these, these first principles, these first practical principles are not technically moral principles and are not technically derived from fact statements. They're simply practical principles. They're first principles of practical reason and there's a bunch of them and they have nothing at all to do with fact statements about our nature, about reality, about anything else. They're simply either intuitive or self-evident first principles, like the law of non-contradiction. So he quotes um, Finnis, yeah, down here at the bottom of this paragraph. They, meaning these first principles, good is to be done, evil is to be avoided, we ought to pursue health, life, uh, knowledge, all those various, that list we come up with later. They are not inferred from speculative principles, they are not inferred from facts, they are not inferred from metaphysical propositions about human nature, or about the nature of good and evil, or about the function of the human being. In other words, they are not inferred at all. They are first principles. They are starting points. They should start sounding kind of like what Lewis is saying, was saying about the Tao, that these, uh, these first principles of the natural law, or of the Tao, or however we want to call it, that these are not conclusions, they are premises, they are starting points. They're the kind of thing that doesn't admit of criticism. Because how could you criticize them without dismissing all of ethics? He even goes on to say, and this is another quote from, um, from the Tao, again, chapter 2. He says, the direct frontal attack, why, what good does it do, who said so, is never permissible. Not because it's harsh or offensive, but because no values at all can justify themselves on that level. So if we take that at surface value, then Lewis is kind of agreeing with, with what we're seeing here from Grisez and from Finnis, that even natural law ethics can't stand up unless we have these unquestioned first principles that aren't derived from anything in particular. Now, if you recall, I said at the time that we're going to push back on that a little bit. And I was understating, because here we are, and McInerney is going to push back on that very hard. He's going to say, no, we definitely can derive these first principles from fact statements. We have to. 
That's where they would have to come from. And it's not enough to just say, well, there they are, and just let them sit there and not really, uh, not really consider whether they can be justified or not. We actually do have to justify them because they're aspects of our thought. We should necessarily justify the things that we believe. All right. With me so far? Sort of? Questions about any of these couple of sections here? What's that? Okay. How's it coming? Yeah, all right. All right. What can we clarify? Anything in here that needs to be clarified or help or might help? Okay. So what I've grabbed so far. All right. Go for we're it. talking about the first principles, mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out if they're factual or valuable. Mm -hmm. Or. Well, they are value statements. They're definitely value statements. The question, the question is whether those value statements just sort of stand on their own or whether they are or need to be justified by some fact statement. Or if they can be. McInerney is going to, be say, is going to go on to say, yes, they absolutely can be justified from fact claims. Because yes, they have to be, and of course they can be, and we will do so, and here's how we do so. We haven't gotten to that yet. We'll get there. We haven't gotten to that in just these couple of sections. But the people he's criticizing here, Grisez and Finnis, are saying that no, these value statements are completely basic. They are first principles. They don't need to be justified, and they can't be justified. They're simply either intuitive, and so they just sort of make sense to us, or they're self-evident, meaning um, they, they carry with them their own evidence. There is no way that they could logically be false or there would be a contradiction. Now, there are philosophers. I haven't read the text he's referring to here, Grisez and Finnis. I've read some of Grisez, but I don't think it's what he's referring to here. Um, as none of this sounded particularly familiar. Um, there are some philosophers who try and make that argument that these first principles cannot be false or you would contradict yourself. Lewis, for that matter, kind of makes that, makes that move um, in, uh, in The Abolition of Man. But that's not really the route they're going at here. They're just saying that these are fundamental values and because they're fundamental, they don't have to rely on anything factual. They don't have to rely on anything like what is human nature like? What are our characteristic ends? What are kinds of things are going to be? conducive to our flourishing, yeah. McInerney, the author of the text, yes. That's his argument. These couple of sections here are basically, here are what these other people have to say as an alternative interpretation of the kind of project that I'm carrying out, right? Because they, Let's put it this way. They more or less agree. Right? Grisez and Finnis are both writing broadly within the, the Thomistic Aristotelian tradition. They're writing uh, natural law philosophy. They're writing about ethics from roughly the same perspective. It's just that they have certain different basic assumptions. Now, some of those assumptions wind up having differences like later on in their applied ethics but we don't really get to that here. The point is looking at the basic assumptions. Basically, these are meta-ethical questions. What justifies our ethical precepts? Why should, we, why should we pursue these particular ends and not others, or not pursue them at all? Which one? Where? Where? Oh, egalitarianism. Basically, what he's saying here, this whole section is to point out that uh, Grisez in particular, Finn is agreeing, but both of them sort of writing together here, um, argue that these basic values, this list of basic values, are all equally basic. That one doesn't, one isn't more important than the other, there's no one that we pursue for the sake of any of the others, and that they're all worth pursuing as ends in themselves, and that the only thing that you can do wrong is to act against one or the other, or more of these basic values. 
So it doesn't really matter which one you're pursuing primarily as part of your life. It's just that um, these are all options on the table that are worth pursuing. And so long as you're not actively undermining one of them by acting for another. So for example, you might, um, so or is there a list? Oh, there it is. So this list right here at the bottom of page 52, right down there, this list. Life, knowledge, play, aesthetic experience, sociability, practical reasonableness, and religion. So all of these are ends in themselves, things that are worth pursuing of their own right, that aren't for the sake of anything further. Again, taking the first two, because these are easy ones to look at, life and knowledge. You can pursue life without really pursuing knowledge. You can sort of live your life and not really investigate things, not really think complicatedly about matters. Most people, about most things. Even us, you know, elite educated people that we are on a grand scale of things, there are lots of things that we really don't try and think about. Not that we try not to, we just don't really pursue it. And we're rather, instead, we're concerned with living our lives. Perfectly fine, perfectly permissible. By contrast, there are people who are not really particularly concerned with living a full, uh, full and healthy life, but are wholeheartedly dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge. So think about the, think about the stereotypical nerd who never goes to the gym, but is always reading books in the library. It might not be all that physically healthy. Their life may not be as, uh, as long, pleasant, and healthy as someone who, uh, who you know, uh, maintains their health carefully, etc. But they're pursuing knowledge. Now, we can also imagine cases where you can pursue one while not just neglecting the other, but acting against the other. You might pursue life not just by not seeking knowledge, but by actively rejecting knowledge. Like if you found out that believing a lie would make your life longer or more pleasant, Uh-oh. I mean, this happens all the time, right? It's unethical, but it happens all the time. Yeah. Believing a lie, even though you, knowing that it's a lie, choosing to embrace it and live your life according to it because it'll make your life better, easier, longer, etc. I mean, the clearest example of this sort of thing is um, like totalitarian regimes, where you have to, where you are sort of forced to accept the party line, or the party in power will make your life hell. They'll send you to the gulags, they'll, they'll send you to the concentration camps, they'll do whatever it is that authoritarian regimes will do to you, or you can just go to, go to kind of lie to yourself and to everyone around you. Rome? Well, Rome. Rome. Oh, 1984? Okay. Thought so. I, I couldn't quite remember if it was 1984 or Brave New World, but it makes sense, 1984. Yeah. Yes, actually, 1984 is an, is an incredible example of this. Um, how many fingers am I holding up? Okay, so every time you say the word, you say four, um, you're brutally tortured until you say three. How many fingers am I holding up? Great. So you are, in, you are directly rejecting the value of knowledge. You're lying to yourself and to those around you to make your life a little, a little easier, a little longer, and a little more comfortable. And that's wrong, right? I mean, not to get overly controversial, I guess, but Think of over the last few years, all of the obviously false things we've been compelled and conditioned to believe. Hmm? Well, a lot of things to do with it, certainly. Well, I mean, for example, it's, it, it has suddenly become very common knowledge and generally accepted that, that COVID originated from, from the, uh, uh, the Wuhan Novel Coronavirus Research Laboratory. It was a lab leak, basically. This lab leak hypothesis has basically been confirmed, and yet um, 
you would be severely penalized both socially and even professionally in a lot of cases for even suggesting such a thing one, two, three years ago. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a lab there that studies novel coronaviruses. I mean, John Stewart said this on, what, Colbert's show or something, like a year and a half ago. Again, it was painfully obvious to anybody paying, to anyone looking at it, unless you were intentionally, uh, intentionally choosing to disbelieve for some other value. That could be life, that could be sociability, right, because other people might think differently of you, et cetera, whatever else might be. Practical reasonableness, because, well, I might as well just believe this false thing because, well, it's not really affecting much in my life. So practicality demands that I just sort of go along and continue doing other things, et cetera. And again, that might apply to, to, to less serious or less severe things as well. You might say, not in this class, obviously, I hope, but in some classes you might just agree with what your professor has to say, even if you think that, it, like in a paper, or in, a, in homework, just re-espouse everything that they say to make them feel better so they'll give you a better grade, even though you know that they're wrong about something, perhaps. Or you might think that they're wrong about something, perhaps. Similarly, though, you might also pursue knowledge at the expense of life, not just neglecting it, but at the expense. So, I mean, think about, why, think about inhumane experiments. Okay. Again, not to go too much on authoritarian regimes, but, but um, think about, like, Dr. Mengele and the during the Holocaust and things like that. Right? Pursuing knowledge, but by horribly mistreating people's lives, real human beings' lives. Things like that as well. Right? All of these things we recognize is obviously wrong, and it's because these, uh, we have these basic values, and by pursuing one while, uh, while pursuing, or sort of going against another one, is obviously wrong. Now, they agree on this, right? Finnis, uh, Grisez, and McInerney all agree that, in fact, yes, it is wrong to go against one value in pursuit of another. The disagreement is minor here, but it winds up being important later on, that these values are rank ordered, that some of them are more important and more fundamentally human than others. Excuse me. However, that still doesn't mean that you can, you can uh, that it's appropriate to pursue one at the expense of another. You can't pursue a lower one at the expense of a higher one, but you even still can't pursue a higher one at the expense of a lower one. They're all fundamental. It's just some are higher and more important and more constitutive of human flourishing in particular. And this is why Aristotle says like rational abstract contemplation is the highest good, even though it's the good that you're probably going to be pursuing the least often. And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's still the highest and most human of human goods because rationality is our highest part or something along those lines. All right. All that was to say a lot about a little. Uh, and it also covers the next couple of sections. We can keep going. Um, I want to address the issue in general that that we can and should think of um, think of these fundamental values as as not being derived from factual statements. Okay, what's McInerney's primary criticism of this fact-value dichotomy of this distinction? What would you say is his main criticism of this? Oh, I, I just happened to stop here. I did not mean to scroll to this part in particular, but I happened to land on something pretty important, so fair enough. Um, so he's quoting Aquinas here. Right. Or, no, he's not. He's not? Oh, no, no. He's, he's quoting somebody who's talking about Aquinas. Sorry. Um, divine. The name divine, not divinity. Um, he's basically pointing out that, no, we don't actually want to think of... Um, we don't want to think of moral values as having nothing to do with the facts of the matter. Think about it this way. We necessarily want to think that there is something about 
us being human in particular, us being the kinds of things that we are that determine what kinds of things that we ought to do, that our actions should be appropriate to ourselves. We say things quite often, even just sort of colloquially, that, that, um, that you're not measuring up to your potential, or things like that. Part of what that means is that there's something that you ought to be. There is some higher end that you ought to be pursuing, but you're falling short of it. So to fall short of it means there is a standard there. We all sort of intuitively want to say this. So how does he get there? Well, he, he points out that, and this kind of comes back to something he talked about before, that we are always already acting. That our actions are already choosing. We are already choosing things whenever we do anything. We're already, always, pursuing some good. So the choice isn't, should I pursue the good? It's, how am I pursuing the good? Am I doing so sufficiently? Or am I falling short of it? So I, I, I said to keep in mind the IKEA example. Right? Okay. Suppose you decide not to follow the instructions in assembling your IKEA furniture. Why would you do that? frustrating. Yeah, it's frustrating to follow the instructions. You're too lazy, and you think you're going to come up with your own way of doing it. Anything else? Anything that you can figure it out on your own. Yeah, you can figure it out on your own. Fair enough. Okay. What if you're right? What if through your, through your inspiration of laziness, perhaps your frustration with the wordless instruction packet, uh, and you do manage to assemble the thing on your own? That's right. That's good, right? Like, the chair works. Who cares if you have a few spare dowel rods? Now you have a few spare dowel rods. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it won't collapse on, under my button at some point. It'll be fine. And maybe you're right. Maybe it actually will be fine. And maybe it'll be perfectly fine. And maybe it works. In which case, if it does work, then great. You've accomplished the goal you set out to accomplish through slightly different means. Now, worth noting, it might not even be different means. The way that you figured out of putting it together might just be what the instructions said, just without following the instructions. That's possible. And there's, again, nothing really wrong with that. However, the instructions are there as a sort of normative principle of here's how this ought to be done. And if you do it otherwise, well, what could happen? What, kind of, what, what might go wrong? Yeah, right? You forgot to install something properly, or you put something in the wrong slot, or you 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 assembled it incorrectly, and it might break. It might not work properly. It might be uncomfortable. Like you might have like misaligned something, and so something's like stabbing into you. Or you might have inverted the seat in the back, and so you're on like a like take this for example, right? This thing. You can imagine if instead of being oriented this way, you had installed it improperly, and so you were trying to sit in it like this, but with the legs on legs facing down. Right? That would be not. That would not be very comfortable. Right? In fact, I have an office chair that I've had to, I followed the instructions, I swear, when I was assembling the thing. It's just not great, not very well designed. The seat, the seat bottom, slants downwards slightly. The back is fine. The back tilts back as it's kind of supposed to. It's just the, act, the base of the seat just sort of tilts forward ever so slightly. So it's like a slant downwards. Like I'm always, I'm always like, there's always this threat of sliding forward off of my chair. Or was. I fixed it. I, I got it to tip back slightly so it doesn't do that anymore. Where was I going with this? <laughs> oh, right. In other words, the set of instructions are there because of what the chair is. Right? It's a chair. It's for a particular purpose. It's supposed to serve that purpose in a particular way. In putting it together according to the instructions is how you get it to fulfill that function. If you do it some other way that still gets it to work, you've still succeeded. If you do it incorrectly, how do you know that you have failed? Yeah, if it doesn't work. If it doesn't do what it's supposed to be doing. If the thing collapses, well, it's a chair. It's not supposed to collapse under you. If it's uncomfortable, well, it's not supposed to be uncomfortable. It's supposed to be a chair. Chairs are supposed to sit you comfortably, more or less. right? You know that your actions failed if they fail according to the kind of thing that you're pursuing. Okay, what are you trying to pursue in broad ethical terms? 
not in IKEA furniture terms. Like the Russians with communism. <laughs> what? what? Like the Russians with communism. They pursued communism okay. for the working class. Then if they Allegedly. Yeah. In the vanguard of the working class. But anyway, uh, that aside. Um, OK, no, I see. Uh, fair example, right? They're pursuing a kind of social stability, equity, and uh, and well, and ultimately prosperity. And they failed on all three counts because the means that they selected to pursue those particular ends were faulty. They, they pursued the, um, let's say, proper ends, broadly speaking, maybe not entirely, but broadly proper ends, social stability, something like equalities, uh, and something like prosperity. Good ends to pursue in a social scale. They pursued them in the wrong way, and so they ultimately failed to attain them. We know that they failed because they failed to attain the goals that they were pursuing, and the goals that they were pursuing were the right kinds of goals for a society. Now, if instead, let's suppose that they were not pursuing prosperity, but they were pursuing poverty and starvation, which at times was the case, but only in certain places for certain people. Holodomor, for example. If you don't know what it is, look it up. Um, starvation campaign that, that killed about 9 million people, I think? Something like that. Mm -hmm. Stalin's Holodomor. Look it up at some point. We only have, ten, we only have seven minutes left. I don't have time to go to this, unfortunately. Um, um, a lot of people died. Um, but let's suppose that was actually the end that they were pursuing. We know that that's wrong. Why? Because it kills so many people. OK. Now, you're right. It might seem like that's just a restatement of the same thing that I just said, right? A lot of people dying is bad because it killed a lot of people. But it's not an empty tautology. The reason that that's wrong is because part of the point of society is for people to survive and thrive together. A lot of people dying in that process, especially like prematurely or painfully or, or democidally dying, that's bad because it's not conducive to the proper ends of a society. Similarly, the proper ends of a human being, right? The ends of a human being are to flourish as a human being, as a rational animal. If you fall short of that end, or if you're pursuing ends that are not conducive to that flourishing, or if you're pursuing your ends in an inordinate or inappropriate way, well, you're already pursuing some ends. You're already pursuing an end because you think it's the right end. To borrow an example from Aquinas that Aquinas borrows from Avicenna, a, um, an Islamic philosopher, to borrow and adapt an example. Suppose you were on fire. OK, got it? Good. OK, um, what would you do about that? Trying to get the fire off? Yeah, right? try and put it out. Why? Because I'm, just, I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, right? It's not good to be on fire. I think we can all agree on this. I think we can all agree that putting out the flames that are consuming oneself is, is a good course of action. Right? There, it would be nonsensical to suggest that whether or not I'm going to put out the flames that are currently killing me is, a, is something that I should bother pursuing or not. No, you, you will. I just about guarantee that you're going to try and put out the fire. What I'm getting at here is that you always are already choosing to act, and you are choosing to pursue certain actions because you think they're good, like not being on fire. That's a good end. That is something that we think is worth pursuing, and I think we're right. Generally, there might be weird limit cases where being on fire is, is all things considered OK. Very weird, very weird limit cases. Um, who was the um, who was the Buddhist monk who set himself on fire as a protest? When was that? It had to do with Tibet. It had to do with the, the freedom of Tibet in 1980, late 80s. I forget when. There's a monk. There, there's a photo of it here. I'll just find it. It's it's. Yes, this. Yeah. Hmm. 
but it's monk who set himself on, who set himself on fire. There are cases where being on fire, all other things, or all things considered, is not the worst thing. Yep. It's where other ends are worth pursuing. Oh, 63. Yeah, he doused himself in gasoline, lit a match. Protest. To bring attention to the horrors that were, that were being committed at the time. It was for some greater social end. Is he sitting there like this? Yeah. No. So he doesn't feel like... Oh, he oh, sure does. But he's so calm. Yes. <laughs> How are you? Did it like work out in his favor? Um, as like protest? To some degree, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he also, he's sitting there dying. Yes. This was also 60 years ago. So he'd have been dead by now anyway, but regardless. <laughs> he built himself different. In other words, that, that's, that's, that is an immense act of self-discipline. Setting everything else aside. Now, there also might, have, might be other cases where being on fire might be okay if you're saving someone from a burning building and you catch fire. The priority might be getting them to safety before you put yourself out. That can be reasonable. Again, very narrow limit cases. But the reason we know that is because we know there, there are particular goods worth pursuing and we know how to pursue them using particular means and we will do so pretty much necessarily. Right? So there is no gap there is no chasm between is and ought. We are already considering ought statements whenever we describe something factually. We describe ourselves factually while we are doing things that are pursuing certain ends. In fact, if you'll pardon the, I suppose, pun, fact statements are themselves pursuing particular ends, saying things that are true, in other words. right? are intellectual exercises, which, which are trying to say things that are descriptive rather than normative. We say them because we think they're true. There is a normativity even to fact statements. There's a reason why saying true things is better than saying false things. It's not even like, I mean, it is ethical because everything is ethical. But it's not ethics in what we ordinarily would think of as in terms of, well, we have these normative statements that are very distinct and different from factual statements. They're ultimately all part of the same, the same scheme of understanding reality.